Today, I'm speaking with Vivian Crawford, Executive Director of the Institute of Jamaica in Kingston, IOJ. Vivian Crawford was born in Moortown, where Nanny of the Maroons was laid to rest. Vivian, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Douglas, Dr. Leah Dr. Douglas. Looking forward to these few minutes, which are always enthralling. There's so much, as you said, we can talk about whenever we meet. There's never a dull moment. I have a few questions for you, Vivian, in the very short time we have on this recording today. And I'm going to ask you to share with us briefly to start, who are the Maroons of Jamaica? And can you say what was their connection, if any, with the indigenous Tayano people of the island? Oh, thank you. And um, before I answer the question, Dr. Douglas, Dr. Leo, I want to thank you most sincerely for this interview, for this interaction we are having. I want to commend you for your continuity to the tangible and intangible heritage of Jamaica, especially about bird study in, um, in the Rio Grande Valley. I am aware that um, according to Marcus Garvey, right, excellent Marcus Garvey, you are following in a story that are people without the knowledge of their past history, heritage and culture, their history is like a tree without roots. So I commend you for that. And I want to thank Mrs. Tracy Comock for this introduction. You both have the inquiring minds. And I must say that I am not a student of flora and fauna as such. I was, um, I saw them in my childhood, but we were not taught the value of that. And when I came to the Institute of Jamaica, I realized that um, flora and fauna, I was accustomed to, uh, Mrs. Comock was able to open my eyes and I'm really indebted to her. Now you ask um, who were the Maroons of Jamaica? And I'm so glad you asked the question because it's sometimes misunderstood by um, persons that maroon is a race. Maroon is a description, um, um, sugarcane in terms of flora. Sugarcane came to Jamaica from Hispaniola and brought here by Captain Bly, but originally you know, um, from India where it was in granular form. And because of sugarcane, we're having this discussion in this way. But um, they, when the British arrived, the Spaniards left, the enslaved who were here, they linked with the Taino descendants and we have Maroons because it's a description um, um, first coined by the Spaniards to refer to us as wild. And perhaps there was method in their soberness or in their madness because um, Professor Colin Chana would tell us that our ancestors did not come through immigration. They, come through, they came through customs because they were regarded as goods. And look at us today. So the links with the indigenous people, the Tainos, is that there was a interaction between them. And Maroons, you should remember, are people who were defying enslavement. They were searching for freedom. They fought for freedom to live. Today, you in, and, and myself in this discussion, we are talking about a freedom to share our heritage. So Mr. Crawford, is it known whether or not those enslaved that took to the hills to forge their own freedom, they encountered the Tayano people. Did they leave any common descendants? No, well, well, well by the time they arrived, by the time our enslaved um, ancestors arrived from Africa, the Spaniards under this, the Spanish watch, uh, most of the Tainos would have, have died out, you know. Only a few would have remained in. So I hear people getting the impression like they had like thousands of tanners who were in Jamaica. No, the Spaniards had, had worked them to death. So when the, 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 the Africans came, so there were not many here, just few. So I, I, I don't take to that because if tanners were here, still, although they were working them, then there would be no need for the Africans to arrive. 
Thank you. Uh, what traditions do you believe are threatened in terms of Maroon culture today? Do you think that some have been lost? And what personally do you think might need to be concerned? Well, they can't be lost because whatever is lost has to be found. <laughs> so let us just say that they are not highlighted. I grew up in a community, Leo, of independence. The only contribution that government, the politicians did, was infrastructure. And so Maroons had their regular, call them sessions. The drums would be played, the song, they would be singing songs, they would be dancing, and you would hear the stories of the ancestors. I'm afraid that is only done now formally once a year through the Maroon celebrations are compound and in more town, the nanny celebration. And I just don't like that because if you do not continue, it will be lost and you will have what is happening, not only in Maroon communities, but say here in Kingston. To my surprise, some years ago, I saw little children coming to my home dressed up in costumes one night asking for sweets because they were embracing another country. I, uh, I think without prejudice, you are aware of that country. It was in November. And if we do not continue, as I just said, what um, right excellent Marcus Garvey said, we have to continue the, the, the practice, our heritage, because we will be like a trees without roots. So those traditions, I remember at Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, such memories, when the first truck or bus arrived 10 miles away from Port Antonio in my own village, and I can speak of my own village, the abeng would be blown. You know what an abeng is, of course. Jamaica's first cell phone. <laughs> that would be blown, and that means that the Christmas season starts. And it is noticed that if you are going to kill true born maroons, you know, they didn't eat goat's flesh. Because goats gave us away when we were in hiding. Ah, they told the British where we were. So it was to kill those who were going to kill the cow or kill the pig. It commenced. And Christmas was not only for December in my community. It went on to March. Why? That is the time the meat which was over the crank crank which was a container over the fire where smoke dried the meat and the meat would finish, wood fire finish, most things would finish. It was a continual celebration. So those traditions, we need more of them. We need more of them. So what places today bear the name or legacy or associations with Nani? Are there any places that still- Oh, that's interesting. Um, you, you, the only place, according to historical records, is Nanny Town. And you know, the British destroyed that in 1734. And that is always the point of contention, contention. Because when it is said that the Maroons betrayed their enslaved, remember the British didn't know where Nanny Town was. It was our own brothers and sisters who went there under the guise that they were seeking freedom, who went back and told the British where Nanny was. So that was destroyed in 1734. But other spaces associated with Nanny, of course, is Moortown, where she's buried. That's where she had her headquarters. And the members of her cabinet, you know, Moortown is in a valley. So the members of her cabinet, they lived very near to her. I know that my own ancestors, the Crawfords, came from Charlestown, a maroon community. And Nanny invited them up because there was a misunderstanding between the Crawfords and one of Nanny's brother in Charlestown. So they were invited up. You also know of Seaman's Valley, where Nanny had a decisive victory over the um, English. And they didn't know the word sailor, but they, know the, they knew that the men came from the sea, over the sea. So the name Seaman's Valley, that's how that name came about. And you would also be aware of a place called Scott's Hall that through the junction, um, they call that place Grand Old Bridge and Scott's Hall uh, uh, Maroon Village is right there, just three minutes 
um, drive away. Nanny walked from Moortown through the middle of the island to a compound to tell her brother, not her brother, not to sign the treaty. And Nanny stayed over at Charlestown. Remember, they traveled only at night. They traveled only at night. And rightly so, not to sign the treaty because you were signing the treaty in a language you did not understand. The British, uh, you are to assign to something you do not understand. And there's a modern writer, I remember his name, Thomas Waste, who said, and lawyers take note, the large print giveth, but the small print taketh away. And words come true. So those were the places associated. What about Nanny with. Town? How, how did that get its name? It's, well, it's, it's called Nanny Town because their headquarters was there. Sorry, my mistake, Nanny Falls. How did, how did Nanny Falls Oh, get no, it? that's a recent phenomenon given by the new uh, maroon colonels because in my childhood, that mm. space was called Big F-O-R-T, Big Fort. Ah. And I passed it almost daily on my um, journeys to the field, especially in August, a place named Cast Hill and New Mountain. Mm -hmm. And there you would see the flora, the bush. Um, I, I remember so well one they called the mackerel bush. We didn't have a um, pharmacy in our time. We didn't have Fenzik mm -hmm. <laughs> and Panadol, but we knew that if we had a headache, you just pick three leaves of a, a leaf called the mackerel bush because the shape was like a mackerel tie the head and pain would be gone. Mm -hmm. But um, Big Ford, Nanny Falls, it's, it's, it's very, very, very dear to me. Of it's course, it's, it's at its best in the month of August during the rainy season. Mm -hmm. you, you hear it thundering like I nearly said Victoria <laughs> Falls. <laughs> and how far is that falls from Morton? Um, I would say about half mile. No, one mile. Call it one man, one man, yeah, but it's, you, you, you don't you don't feel it as they say, because mm -hmm. there is so much to see. You are walking and walking. It's and it's a trip worth it. And mm -hmm. many persons who have been to Moortown will tell me that they've been to Nanny Falls. I say you just have come. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that uh, association and history, because I myself didn't know that the falls had changed its name. So. Tell me about Busso. I had Busso. I think this would have been for the first time in 2002. What is Busso and what memories do you have of going to the river growing up as a child? You scientists call it what? We say Molos. That's the scientist's oh, name. Um, I think I learned elsewhere something similar to it called Cockles and Mussels. <laughs> there is such a song, Alive, Alive, oh, Dublin's Fair City. Um, oh, my childhood. You, um, you, you, you went to the river and that was, we said, caught. You catch it, um, of the stones at nights. They came out at nights, I suppose, for feeding. And that would be in the months of July, August, when the river was not in spate, the Rio Grande, and you would um, take it off and then you would take it home in this big pan and then you'd pour water on it. And then you have to, put it in boiling water because it has a little shell. And if the heat takes it, it will just cover it and you couldn't get it out. So you drop it in hot water and then um, you say it's cold, say so just for about five minutes so that it's opened um, the, the, the fleshy part there. And they use the prickle from citrus, grapefruit, um, orange, and then you carefully take it out, just stick it and it comes out. And then I'm telling you now the cuisine um, of that is done. And then you, you again, the, you say you scall that. And then you, they, they are going to use flour and they are going to mix it with flour, 100% coconut juice. That is just as much coconut juice as possible. Um, and a, a little water. And then they, you put seasoning preferably the green scotch bonnet. So it's a thick stew and that is served hot with roasted breadfruit, slightly turned. <laughs> and, like a very and, good and men, 
Men like to drink the busu soup for reasons which we cannot tell in this interview. <laughs> it has to be left to the imagination. Yes, but, but deep, deeply cultural reasons, no doubt. Indeed, indeed, indeed. What other memories do you have of, of, of the river days in those young? Oh, days? yes. Well, we did not know any holidays. We had nowhere else to go. So Rio Grande, oh, God bless Rio Grande. We had rafting on the Rio Grande, and there was division of labor as children. Um, one would be um, breadfruit, you know, is wild there. So you have roasted breadfruit, what you call salt butter. <laughs> And then somebody would be picking the coconut, we call it jelly, the young ones, put it in the water to keep it cool. And that would be the drink, roasted breadfruit with um, salted butter, or sometimes they would be able to catch a fish or two. And then you would roast it on the charcoal. And then you would, what we, we call it, bathe. But we're splashing in that river until your eyes were red. And at four o'clock, you would be home. And this was done from Monday to Thursday. Mm -hmm. Every other day or sometimes every day. And it was just joy. What I, what I remember about the Rio Grande, Mr. Crawford, was that this water was fridge water. It was so cold. Yes. Must be the reason why your skin is, has, been, has been maintained and that water must be good for health all over. Oh, yeah. And we, and we, drank, and we drank that too, you know. But mm. we didn't drink the river water. We had spring water. And I'm so glad you mentioned the river. Because mm. we in Moortown, um, we don't have flooding as such because the respect for the river is almost sacrosanct. The, for instance, you go to the river, there are certain... Um, rules that you would be engaging of cleanliness. And you're always told from childhood, whichever point you are in the river, somebody is below you, somebody is above you. One day you could be below. One day you could be below and getting all those that were in the middle are at the top. So there is such a beautiful respect. Garbage is never thrown in our river. No, no. It's, 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 it's just only thing that goes on in the river, bathing and washing of clothes and to take the water. But you never drink the river water because we have too many springs. I had to go over, cross about four springs to go to school. Mm -hmm. And I could see the school from my home. Mm -hmm. It abounds in springs. What, what birds do you remember? Oh, birds, the birds. Oh, some I know. Um, well, birds, again, in our district is sacrosanct. Hmm. And I think it is a religious upbringing that God cares for the birds. And if God so cares for the birds, we too should take care of the birds because God puts us here not to hurt them. And so there was always a reluctance. We didn't as it were hunt birds. Although there were some boys, especially in April, when the apple blossoms would be in, would have a thing called Benap, the Benap piece of stick and put the blossoms at the end and put a, like a trap a piece of string on it, the bird step on it, the bird would be caught. But not many um, children did that because of the respect. And the, we spoke earlier about the robin red breast. I remember the green feathers, and the, the red um, in front there. And we were told that, oh, that was the bird who, which was sorry for our Lord when he was crucified. And it went to be with our Lord and some of the blood from Christ fell on his breast. It's of course, it's a legend, but it's a nice legend. <laughs> and then we, we, we had to sing about um, um, the sparrow, that God's eyes on the sparrow and he watches over us. And my brother, Staff, his name is Orthon, he's in England. And he always told me this story, Leo. I just cannot get over it. And you saw it in the Grace Kennedy lecture about a little bird named Chip Chip. You know, have heard of that bird? Chip Chip? Yep, absolutely, yes. Very small bird. Mm -hmm, very and my, small brothers, bird. my brother said that we, we should never be like Chip Chip. 
pleased with ourselves because you say that that bird walks very cautiously, almost teethily. And somebody asked the bird, so why are you walking like that? Chip, 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 shh. I can't walk any heavier. If I walk any heavier, the earth will sink. So <laughs> it was very pleased with itself. That's a and, good story. I'll remember that one. And of course, finally, oh, the egress. They are, we used to call them garland. And they flew up in the mornings. We were too busy to notice them. But in the afternoons, about, they flew from uh, it would be Port Antonio end, um, west, and then they are going up to Mill Bank, Kuna Kuna Pass. And then in the afternoons, they flew down. And on their way down as children, we knew when they were coming out and everybody, the whole village would be calling out, turn back, darling, turn back. Turn back, darling, turn back. And invariably one would drop out of the flock and so on. And of course, you expect me to mention about John Crow. That is the bird that is despised. Oh my God. And they An iconically Jamaican. Yes, if they're going to curse, they, they call if they call you a John Crow. Of course, they, they use the first vowel, the A instead of the O. And um, you perhaps know this song where mm. John Crow said, John Crow said, him no work on Sunday. If you think I like, kill your maga cow. And you mm. can't trust it because you go and kill your maga cow and not looking drunk or will eat it. Yeah. Although it said, it does work on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> there are so many rich Jamaican sayings about the junk. I was just remembering one my uh, grandmother used to say, John Crow, no him bottom, stay before him swallow abbe seed. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. the equivalent of that is that my friend told me that his mother told him if, if monkey going by um, trousers, he must know his part and go and put him tail. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, uh, you, 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 you're you bringing such memories, Mr. Crawford. There's another one which speaks to these histories of how we see ourselves in relations to others to... Um, do you know this one every junk on think, thinking pick me white? Oh, yes, uh, because it's, it's, it's the, the feathers are black, but it's mm -hmm. a pretense. It is a pretense. Yep. Uh -huh. You think we pick yep. me white, and yep. you're too so black. Yep, yep. <laughs> the the, the junker is, is maybe one of the most represented birds in the culture. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to mention? You know, today we are having this session with artists and talking about Nani's connection to the hills and land. Anything else that, that comes to well, you? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question too, because it must, the audience, the audience listening must not think or watching, must not think is a one-off. What you are doing, you are working on continuity. You are, as it were, sowing seeds that for the generation yet unborn to be traveling on this path, um, when I was your age, um, I was singing about Britannia Rule the Waves. So it's very nice to know that somebody could be sharing like you with the world, reminding the world that although Britannia ruled the waves, they couldn't rule the bush. And Nanny showed that. Also in 2017, the minister, Mike Henry, read this apology from Oxford University Press to say that enough was not said about Nanny and the British. And so we are on a journey and we give thanks that you are devoting your life for the continuity of that purpose. So as they say in uh, Moreton, the ancestors said that the news would be taken to their grave. Ants would take the news to their grave. Another fauna, ants would take the news to the grave. So I want to say, Dr. Leo, if we see mad ants, if you see ants around, you don't think it's mad ants. They are hurrying because, you know, ants are, uh, they are hurrying to take the news to say, Danny's story is taught. It is oil. It cannot be kept under the water. And we thank you for facilitating this process. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Crawford. And we're looking forward to sharing this not only with Jamaicans as a whole, but also, as you said, ensuring that the new generation, the young Maroons are part and parcel of all of this 
thank you for your time. I know that your day is packed with so many meetings. So this was greatly appreciated. All the time for you, sir. Yes. And looking forward to our next conversation. And we'll send you some bussu virtually. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That would be a blessing. Don't forget the, the, the roast breadfruit, please. Ah, God bless. Right. Yes, bye for now. Bye for now.